everyone. I am Abraham Ames. Uh, I work for the Orleans County Conservation District, and we are managing a lake and watershed action plan for Willoughby Lake in Westmore, Vermont. Now, even if you're not a local, you might be aware that Willoughby Lake has exceptionally clean water, some of the best in the state. Unfortunately, the lake is experiencing an upward phosphorus trend, which eventually will change the nature of the lake and lower its water quality. So the time, is act, the time to act is now to preserve the water quality. Um, DEC uh, made this decision and selected the lake uh, to fund a lake and watershed action plan. Uh, as I said, the Orleans County Conservation District is managing that, and we are fortunate uh, to have been able to have partnered with the Memphis Magog Watershed Association. Patrick Hurley will be conducting our environmental assessments and will be taking us through the current conditions of the lake and will be outlining our work uh, that we have going forward with the Lake and Watershed Action Plan. So, Patrick, you have the floor. Wonderful, thank you, Abe. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here and introduce myself. So I, I am a project manager for the Memphis Magog Watershed Association, and our mission is to protect and preserve the natural beauty and and uh, ecosystems of the Memphis Magog Watershed, within which Willoughby Lake sits. Actually, it's at the top of our watershed, and uh, we're very fortunate and, and privileged to be able to provide you know, assistance on this important work to maintain the you know, exceptional water quality and aesthetic that is the Willoughby watershed. So tonight I'm, I'm focusing mostly on the, the known existing conditions of, of the watershed and the lake itself. So with watershed action plans, we wanna take kind of a holistic approach to understanding you know, where these positive phosphorus trends are coming from and where these, you know, potential phosphorus sources might lie and reside within the watershed. And so we take an approach that starts from kind of a bird's eye view, get a, a you know, lay of the land. We also consider water quality monitoring data, land use and land change patterns, and things like infrastructure, roads, stormwater, you know, drainage infrastructure that might you know, accelerate or implicate you know, further areas of, of water quality concern or degradation. Um, so we're gonna be talking about both the physical characteristics of the watershed and the lake, and also the biological and natural communities that, that sit within the watershed um, and provide co-benefits and ecosystem functions that, that uh, are necessary to maintain a healthy ecosystem within the, within the basin. So, oh, a little speed dating facts about Lake Willoughby. Um, it's a relatively small watershed considering the size of its lake. There's about 11 and a half thousand acres of upland uh, in the, that drain to the lake and the lake is 1700 acres. So, you know, a very large body of water and a moderately sized watershed for Vermont. It's very deep, however. So 320 feet in its maximum depth, that results in this very large volume of water. And so while we don't have any major tributaries coming into the lake, other than some of the small brooks that you cross along Route 5 and along um, Long, Long Pond Road, um, that small trickle of water entering this large volume of water results in this very extensive residence time, we call it. So there's on average nine years between water entering at the south end of the lake and flowing out at the north end of the lake. So the water that we have in the lake it resides there for quite a long time. And so we can't change how long that water is there or how we can't ref refresh that water once it's in the lake, but we can control the quality of the water that's coming off the mountains entering into the lake. And that has strong implications for water quality, for phosphorus uh, pollution, for you know, cyanobacteria blooms or invasive species, um, and also the aesthetic properties that, that we kind of love um, in Willoughby Lake. And so the whole action plan is, is devised to address you know, nutrient trends, invasive species, shoreland habitat, and the infrastructure and developed lands that surround our water bodies. Uh, the state produces these lake scorecards for each uh, major lake and pond in Vermont. And as you can see in here, we have some data for Willoughby. Um, primarily what we look at are the, the four areas of concern that are most easily monitored in water quality. So we have their spring total phosphorus, 
um, dating back all the way to 1979. We also have summer total phosphorus. We have summer secchi disc, which is a measurement of water clarity. And we have summer chlorophyll A, which is a measurement of algae growth. And as you can see, the only panel that has red uh, is the spring total phosphorus annual means. And that indicates that since 1979, since data has been collected, we've seen this positive trend, this, this increase in, in mean phosphorus concentrations in the springtime. And that is detrimental to water quality. As an oligotrophic lake, Lake Willoughby should be at 14 parts per billion phosphorus or lower. And uh, currently we're measuring um, you know, greater than that for our, class, or our B2 uh, water quality classifications. Our A1 water quality, quality classifications actually dictate lower levels than even 14. So we try to strive to meet those standards that are set by the state. Uh, we also have spring total phosphorus increases uh, over the past, sh the, the shorter time frame that, that indicate a, a rapid increase in phosphorus concentrations in the last 20 years um, when, we, when we take out the consideration of data from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So that increase has really been happening in the last two decades. There's also been monitoring performed by volunteers of the Westmore Association on six tributaries to the lake. And so we monitor the outlets of these tributaries to try to get an understanding of, of the water quality conditions that are feeding into the lake. And this represents the land use, land development patterns that are upstream of those monitoring sites. And so there are 43.3 miles of map perennial streams in the Willoughby watershed. Uh, there are a lot more miles of intermittent or what we call ephemeral streams that don't always flow. Um, but for monitoring purposes and the proportion of water inputs to the lake, you know, these six tributaries represent the majority of our watershed drainage area. Uh, and we've noticed that uh, there are some elevated levels of both chloride and total phosphorus. As you can see, chloride has a maximum concentration of 101 at the south end of the lake. And while that may seem high, these are milligrams per liter and the state sets water quality standards at 239 milligrams per liter. So we're well below the water quality standards that, that we don't face those challenges that often people hear about with fluoride in the Western parts of the states and the Champlain Basin. Um, that said, we do see really high phosphorus concentrations coming from some of these tributaries. In particular, the highest measurement, 255 parts per billion we're taking, we're taking at what locals call Roaring Brook. And this is, an order of magnitude higher than what we would hope to see coming out of some of these tributaries feeding into the lake. So the water quality data really allows us to kind of pinpoint what subcatchments within the watershed might be contributing greater proportion of phosphorus loads um, at different times of year. Now this is only summer data, and so we're not necessarily capturing that spring runoff event where the roads are shedding a lot of water and road sand and silt, um, and fields don't have much vegetation on them to to retain that runoff. And so, you know, we can expect quite variable concentrations from all these tributaries across, you know, years and, and weeks and seasons. Uh, but it does give us a, some evidence to pinpoint some more efforts for follow up field assessments. When you zoom out and look at the whole watershed and, and how the ground essentially is covered, um, we have, we are very fortunate. We have nearly 86% of our watershed in the Willoughby lake drainage is, is forested, and that's vastly dominated by deciduous, deciduous forests. Um, when we look at our impervious surfaces, those surfaces that don't allow rain or precipitation to infiltrate and, and percolate into the ground, um, we see that it really only represents about 2% of the lake uh, or the watershed surface area. And so there's not a lot of development in Lake Willoughby watershed and that allows us to maintain this you know, high quality water and, and exceptional water use um, you know, year after year. And we also have, you know, 5% of our, of our coverage is, is wetland. So there's, there's lots of intact habitat in, that can protect our watershed from, you know, erosion and sediment and runoff from developed areas. When you zoom a little bit closer and you're only considering the 100 foot buffer around the lake, these numbers change quite a bit. Now we're only at 56% forested cover, meaning that we have less trees on our shorelines than we do everywhere else in the watershed. Um, we have only 3% of wetlands, which is almost half of what we had in the greater watershed as a whole. There's no agriculture in this 
portion of the watershed. But when you look at our impervious surfaces, they've nearly gone up tenfold. We're almost approaching 20% impervious surface. Uh, so that's an important component of our watershed health and our lake water quality. The shoreline is, a, is an interface between the water and the land. And if we have too much concentrated development along the shoreline, we don't have stable shoreline um, areas. They, they're prone to erosion. We have faster runoff from driveways, rooftops, and paved areas. We have uh, less habitat for, for the critters, uh, less connectivity between upland and, and, and lowland habitats. And so we really want to you know, zoom into this area and see where can we make improvements along our the lake periphery that will provide you know, an improvement in the quality of that interface between the lake and the uplands. For a small watershed, it does have a fair amount of roads. There are over almost 40 miles of roads in the Willoughby Lake watershed. Uh, the vast majority of those are owned by the town. 57% are owned by the town. That's what you can see in that mustard yellow. Um, there's also a major state highway running along the, the east side of the lake. And there's uh, a mix of private roads. A quarter of the road networks in the watershed are actually private. And so we don't have any data about the condition of these roads or their, their um, likeliness to erode or contribute sediment loads to the lake. And so we need to consider roads when we're looking at the watershed as a whole and also when we're zooming into that shoreland area because roads are those impervious surfaces that very quickly shed runoff when it rains or when snow is melting. They, they collect a lot of road grit, sand, salt, you know, oil and grease from cars. Fertilizers come off of driveways and run, or come off of lawns and run down roads into the drainage ditches. And so we need to take a, a, a good look at our roads um, and based on the ownership and opportunities for, you know, water quality improvement projects, start chipping away at problematic areas or areas that are prone to contribute sediment into a road um, based on the way water moves across the landscape. And I believe 2018, um, the Orleans Count Conservation District and the town of Westmore performed uh, road erosion inventories across all of the public roadways in the watershed. And they essentially score them based on whether or not they're hydrologically connected. So does water that land on the road, does it run off into a, either a wetland or a stream? Those are hydrologically connected. And those are um, the colored segments that you see on this map. The black segments are not hydrologically connected. So they should not be prone to excess runoff or erosion or sediment contributions. But those colored segments, those are the ones that we evaluate or that the Orleans Conservation District evaluated for their risk of erosion. Uh, the green segments fully meet the permit requirements stated in the municipal road general permits um, for the town of Westmore. The, the yellow um, segments are incomplete data, so they haven't been fully assessed. The orange partially meet the permit requirements, and so there's room for improvement. And the red segments um, are non-compliant, so there's quite a need for uh, improving those roads and, and to and employing best management practices to, main, to manage the runoff and the sediment that might be derived from those roads. Um, and as you can take a glimpse of the map, there's are, there are a few areas where these road segments are concentrated. We actually see them in the upper tributaries and the headwaters where it's often steeper, where the roads might be older or less wide and less well built, um, where we have higher prone, higher, higher chance of, you know, undersized culverts and a lot more driveways. And so you know, we like to take our look, a look from the top of the watershed down and address how water is moving across the landscape, how our roads are impacting that and affecting that, and how we can better manage runoff from the roads to protect the lake's water quality. Along these roads are a lot of culverts. There are over 200 culverts that have been inventoried by the state agency of transportation. Um, and they're scored in, along a general spectrum of, of, of scores where you have good, good, you have excellent in blue or green, you have fair and yellow, orange or poor, red or critical. And there's actually one urgent out there um, that are, that imminently need to be addressed. Now this, these data are a handful of years old and the town of Westmore 
uh, road association or roads department have been working you know, since the road erosion inventories to address those priority segments. And culverts are often part of those priority segments. And so what we would propose to do is, you know, reevaluate where some of these culverts are in the landscape and how they affect the movement of water, the movement of sediment, and potential phosphorus loading um, to the lake and whether there's room for retrofit or opportunity for replacement. These culverts, uh, of the 200 culverts, 31 were assessed for their geomorphic compatibility. Now this is you know, a determination of whether the culvert or crossing is suitable for the size of the channel that's passing through it. And uh, we have a mixed score on some of these. There's, a, there's one of them that are compatible, fully compatible in the watershed. The rest are either mostly or partially incompatible. Um, we have fully incompatible culvert at one site on Long Pond Road. And so the reason that we look into these data is geomorphically speaking, is this crossing a problem? Is it undersized? Is it prone to clogging? Is it prone to blowouts? Is it prone to failure? We'd like to address that before an event happens so that we can mitigate the potential for you know, larger scale erosion events, and large scale washouts. We'd like to get our eyes on these culverts before those events happen so that we can start planning for their repair, their retrofit, retrofit or their replacement. And these are also dominated, or the incompatible crossings are concentrated on Stony Brook, Roaring Brook, and Mill Brook. And so we're gonna to propose to um, take a peek at some of these culverts while we're doing our road assessments. Um, alongside these geomorphic compatibility assessments were aquatic organism passage assessments. So these determine whether aquatic organisms, organisms like fish, amphibians, reptiles can make their way upstream through these crossings or whether they're um, impeded by these crossings. Now, what often stops passage is a perched culvert where it's a foot or so higher than the water surface on the downstream end. So if there's a step between the pool and the bottom of the culvert, many species can't get up and over that. And so that prevents their up river movement. And as we know, fish need up river tributary spawning and nursery grounds to maintain healthy populations. And so when we look at our map culverts and how they score on the aquatic organism passage, uh, it's not very good. Um, it's, it's outright a little bit bleak. There are, there's no aquatic organism passage on, on almost half of the, actually more than half of the culverts in the watershed, um, reduced or, uh, passage on another third of the culverts. And, and only full uh, passage on one of the culverts. So if we're thinking about the fisheries and the populations in the lake, and we wanna manage for healthy, robust, self-sustaining fish populations, we should really be considering making sure the passage is, is um, available for these species to get up into their, their headwater habitats. And so these will also be evaluated briefly during our road erosion assessments and our culvert assessments to identify projects that may have a sediment reduction potential as well as habitat uh, improvement potential. Another data set we looked at were the potentially erosive features. Now these are derived from high resolution LIDAR data and it essentially uses slope, soil erodibility, um, proximity to streams and a few other parameters to identify where erosive features might be on the landscape. And when you look at the whole Willoughby area, you see there's quite a lot of red. Um, and most of these can be ignored because as we know, the Willoughby watershed is, is pretty high gradient and high relief um, naturally just through the geology. And so a lot of the red areas uh, on the east and west shores of the lake are actually natural gullies and natural um, uh, ravines that are formed from the, from the mountains. Uh, there's also a handful of areas that, that may be mischaracterized as, as ditches or as driveway regrading. And so when we pull out some of those um, points that don't really speak to us or don't show a major potential sediment contribution source, um, what we're left with are areas that look to be historic logging roads or historic skid paths, um, old ditches that dump into tributaries that may be 
down cutting and eroding right at the mouth of the ditch um, or other areas where there's been channelization um, in streams that might indicate a, a uh, departure from how the stream would naturally function. So as we go through the process of our assessments for our road streams and lake shorelands, you know, we will keep an eye out for some of these erosive features and in some of these larger upland properties where there was a history of logging or agriculture, you know, we'll take a closer look at some of the uh, potentially erosive features on the map to see if they result in, in real erosive features on the landscape. So there have been at least five years of Eurasian milfoil control in Lake Willoughby, and Eurasian milfoil is an invasive aquatic plant species. Um, and there have been four to six target areas for treatment over the past um, five years of, of work. And overall, the contractor who performs this work says Willoughby Lake is looking good. It's got a, a trend towards control of these populations, um, but they encourage continued monitoring, continuing, continued harvest, you know, diver assisted harvest to pull those weeds out, um, you know, remove that, that propagation source and, uh, you know, work to improve the aesthetics and, and the you know, lake shoreland habitat back to its natural state. And in any of these projects that we try to assess, identify and develop as water quality and phosphorus reduction projects should in theory have, you know, benefits towards aquatic invasive species in the sense that their plants, by reducing the phosphorus loading to the lake, there's less nutrients available for those plants to have these large blooms or these large populations. And so while we, these water quality projects may not directly address the invasive species populations, they are working to reduce the, the, the ability for those populations to be so prolific. I mentioned fisheries when speaking about the, the passage or passability of the stream crossings. And when speaking to the district fish biologists, I was told that the priority in the Willoughby watershed are salmonids. And that can include both Atlantic salmon landlocked that are stocked in the lake. And that can also include many of the trout species that we've seen in the lake. The rainbow trout species are self-sustaining populations in the Willoughby watershed. Um, their abundance has been fluctuating. It may be low in the past few years than it has been in the past 20. Um, and perhaps that may be related to, you know, a lack of headwater habitat or access to those headwater habitats. Um, lake trout are also self-sustaining. The abundance is very high. And when you talk about the size structures, that's kind of the, the population, whether they're you know, young of the year and juveniles or fully, fully mature adults, um, apparently the size structure will be is one of the best in Northeast Vermont. So you can take pride in that. Uh, rainbow smelt is one of the most important forage species for lake trout, rainbow trout, and salmon. And they have a high abundance in the lake. Um, and they are you know, small trout-like uh, fish that may not be a game species, but it is an important keystone in maintaining these healthy trout populations. And so monitoring the rainbow smelt populations gives us a sense of the the, um, the resiliency of the trout populations. There's also a few other interesting species of, of, of uh, note. One is burbo, uh, yellow perch, which is an important game fish, minnows, white suckers, and will be as home to the only round white fish population in the state. So it's another thing that you can write home about. We have this relatively intact, strong, robust native fish population. There are no bass present in Willoughby Lake, and the intent is to keep it that way. Bass are uh, ferocious predators and compete readily with salmonids um, for prey. And so they are competitive, they, and they may have a competitive advantage, you know, under the change in climate or precipitation patterns. Um, so we do want to make sure that bass are not introduced to the Willoughby watershed. There are a handful of rare, threatened, and common species in the Willoughby watershed, none of which I can divulge the specific information um, or concern about both the integrity and, and the uh, protection of the species. There's you know, concerns of, of rare species black market trading that as a agreement with the state, we can't divulge specific information, but do take pride in knowing that there are you know, uncommon invertebrates, vertebrate animals, plants, vascular plants, um, scattered throughout all 
across the watershed, both in the lake, in the ponds up upstream from the lake, and in the in the cliffs and, and forests that surround um, Westmore. And these critters are able to thrive here because of the the real rich mixture in that natural communities. We have ten significant significant natural communities uh, in the watershed. Uh, my favorite being the dwarf, uh, dwarf shrub bog and the boreal, acidic, and calcareous cliffs. So uh, there are there are important variable variabilities between slope aspects, underlying geology, and hydrology that allow these communities to be positioned across the Willoughby watershed in a relatively small area, but across a, a big spectrum of, of conditions. And so we have anything from the classic northern hardwood forest of you know, ma maples and birch and, and uh, ash to some of the red spruce and northern forests. And a lot of these different communities are able to coexist in a relatively short distance from each other because of the, the large gradient in relief. You know, we start at only a couple hundred feet or a couple thousand feet and go up to 2,500 by the time you're at Pisgah. So that, that provides, you know, changes in climate, changes and soil that allow for these different communities to develop. And so it's worth noting of these communities and of these rare, threatened, and uncommon species while we're looking for projects and while we're developing projects. One, so that we can be aware of their sensitivities and we can avoid any unnecessary impacts to those populations. And two, so that if there are opportunities to provide habitat benefits, we can get co-benefits you know, aligned with water quality benefits, and that will score better when we essentially request funding, grant funding to design and implement these projects. So important co-benefits to be, you know, kept in mind. So from this baseline kind of assessment, we then develop these proposed um, field assessments um, that really focus on lake shorelands and develop lands around the lake. Um, private and public road screenings, tributary walks and stream bank assessments. And then we're also interested in taking peaks at the culverts and potentially roasted features while we're out and about looking at for these different features across the landscape so that we can you know, evaluate, are these contributing disproportionately high sediment or phosphorus loads? You know, are they preventing aquatic organism passage? Is it Posing a threat or a flood or erosion risk to downstream or, or neighboring parcels. Um, and all of these can be kind of teased into a matrix where we can evaluate their priority based on you know, the cost to benefit ratio, the phosphorus reduction potential, you know, the co-benefits that I mentioned, and, and the community, um, the community desires and, and wishes. You know, some projects may score better, but the community wants to see another project in place first. And those are all considerations that we can take into you know, the calculus that is you know, project identification, prioritization, and development. So these are some maps of the proposed areas that we will assess. They're essentially um, taking out all the noise from those first few slides and highlighting the areas that we intend to focus and look, focus our efforts and look for water quality um, challenges and opportunities. So these are the roads. These are the moderate to high risk erosion road, uh, high erosion risk roads. There are no private roads that are mapped because the state doesn't have data on them. So we are going to work with the Orleans Conservation District to identify which road associations and which private roads um, are eligible and interested in receiving these assessments. We also notice that a lot of these roads are concentrated in the upper tributary areas, and these are often because they're just gravel roads and steep slopes, so they're more prone to erosive um, erosion and degradation. Uh, of the 43.3 miles of streams, we intend to walk about 15 of those miles. Uh, these are all of the streams that have demonstrated high phosphorus uh, concentrations. These run through the most densely developed or densely agricultural parcels, and they often have a lot of energy coming streaming off the mountain. So we're going to do some walks and we're going to look for channel erosion, bank erosion, riparian buffers, um, and other indications of sediment or water quality opportunities uh, that we can work with landowners to address. Uh, these maps highlight the, the potentially problematic culverts that we'd, we'd like to get our eyes on. There's an awful lot of them. We don't 
really feel like we'll have the capacity to address every single one of them, but from these groupings, we'll select the, the highest priority um, culverts and work you know, work with our partners in the private landowners to see how we can address the issues that they may um, demonstrate. When you pull out all the noise from those erosive features, you know what we found are there just seems to be some potential indications of of erosion from the upland forest, which isn't really expected, um, but it's pretty typical. When we see old logging operations and old road cuts that haven't been maintained or have had, you know, decades of regrowth on them, they can still fail. They can still act as, you know, these large sediment contributors. And so, you know, where possible, we're going to work with landowners to get on the ground and get our eyes out to these areas and look for gullies and look for washouts um, or incising stream channels, you know, where we might be able to do some work on the ground to arrest that erosion and mitigate that sediment. And then some of the most densely developed areas, both lake shoreland, um, residential, commercial, or agricultural, or whatever it may be, uh, we do hope to work with the landowners to get on the ground and look for opportunities to do anything from managing ditches um, from farms to you know, small stormwater treatment or green stormwater infrastructure practices um, on commercial or developed lands or implementing lake-wise and lake shoreland restoration projects on the residential lots that are concentrated on the lake shore. Uh, and all of these areas are mostly focused on the northern half of the lake, and that's primarily based on land use. You know, we don't have any development on the southwest half or quarter of the lake and very little on the, on the southeast half. So uh, the developed lands will be a, a major focus for the Orleans Conservation District being uh, the leaders in the lake-wise effort and having very close ties to the farming community in the area. And then just so you're not, you know, spinning with questions about how all this work is going to be funded, there are there are monies out there to do this work. And so this, this LWAP is essentially laying up the partners in the town to identify projects that are eligible for these specific grant programs. And we have anything from project development funding to design to implementation, to long-term operations and maintenance. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are, these are grant programs in Vermont that are specific to water quality, specific to natural resources or agricultural sectors or stormwater that can be teased out through the development process, the project development process to identify how are we gonna pay for these projects you know, what angles do we have to work? What co-benefits do we need to capture to really be eligible and strong contenders for these grants? And you know, this will allow partners to be able to continue this work even after the LWAP is complete because there'll be money out there and opportunities out there for people to pick up a project and say, okay, we identified it, we know the problem. Let's go get development funding. Let's work with the landowners. Let's get a design contractor, put together a plan, get it implemented with some contractors, and then we can, provide operations and maintenance funding uh, based on a different type of project and the needs of that project through the course of its lifespan. So all that is to say, we, we think we know a lot about the Willoughby watershed at the moment, but really this is just kind of the, the you know, the, the uh, spark notes version. What we really need to do is get down on the ground, get on the lake, get in, you know, on, along the roads and we need to start scoping out, screening, and identifying opportunities where we can mitigate runoff, mitigate sediment, reduce phosphorus load into the lake, and we can where we can work with the community to, to attain those goals, but also you know, promote the beautification, promote the setting, and really build on the values that the community wants to see in the future that they envision for Westmore and Willoughby Lake. So um, with all that, we will you know, be you know, developing our actual field assessments over the next couple of weeks, getting into the field in the fall of 2022 and spring of 2023, and we'll regroup with the community, you know, the town, public, and our partner organizations, DEC, Orleans County Conservation District, and uh, Memphis Mangrove Watershed Association to really prioritize and identify okay, which projects are we going to focus on now. So thank you very much for your time, and Abe, back to you. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> really appreciate that great rundown. Um, really looking forward to working with you on this project and uh, feel really grateful and privileged um, to have such a beautiful lake um, that we can focus our attention on. And um, 
I think the conservation effort here will be a, bear real fruit. Uh, glad to hear that we're not just looking at water quality, we're looking at the greater landscape. And I think there's gonna have a lot of opportunities to really enhance uh, the town in general and um, you know, conserve what is really excellent habitat and a beautiful landscape. So yep. thank you very much. And um, to the greater community, please stay tuned. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you'd like to be involved. Otherwise, just pay attention. There will be more. Thank you, everyone. Take care.